you in here? Yeah. <laughs> Made in China. <laughs> taught to write and think 
and had to read voluminously. I mean, it, it was like it was like a graduate college course. So, and we were held to task with everything. So when I came to college, um, I was I was ready to write just about anything, and I thought, well, now this class is really going to be. This is what I'm going to really, you know, kind of settle into and really use my skills that I learned uh, with uh, Mr. Holzman, with Dr. Sacker, and I think that will go well. And it did. But I learned something with uh, with Jack. By the way, I never called him Jack. Even when we were colleagues, he was always Dr. Sacker because, as he would say, I earned this doctorate. I'm not Jack. I'm Dr. Sacker. <laughs> um, my first paper was, I think, something on uh, Josquin Dupre, the great French uh, composer. You know, you reach into a hat and you pick something, and it was Josquin. Great. And it was some motet. Great. Fantastic. Five-page paper. I'm into it. We had maybe 10 days, two weeks to do it, and everything was great. Get it back. Some nice comments. And, hey, fantastic. Some exams. No problem. Listening. A lot of listening. <coughs> a few weeks go by. We have another assignment. Reach in the third movement or the final movement to the Haydn Symphony Number no. 45 in F sharp minor, Farewell Symphony. Well, that has a great story to it and a great program to it, and it's funny and it's, it's humorous. It's basically where you can imagine um, the uh, an 18th century orchestra. Now their stands are illuminated by candles, and each section leaves the stage at some point, starting about midway through the movement. And when they leave the stage, they extinguish the candle. So the stage gets uh, the stage gets less and less populated. The orchestration gets thinner and thinner. The stage gets darker and darker until finally it's only the, the first stand violins that are just playing a couple of notes at the end. And it was Haydn's, um, it was Haydn's way of saying, hey, you know, we really need a vacation here. Because they were promised a vacation then then the Duke took it away in, in order to, uh, to have uh, Haydn and his orchestra write, uh, write some music for a special occasion. So he made his point. I loved writing about that, did really well, I got an A, so I'm doing really well, loving this class, high standards. And then we get to the third <clears throat> assignment, and I eagerly dip in, and I pull out the card, and I look at it, and I read the finale to the second act of Mozart's Don Giovanni. <laughs> Opera. <Yeah>. Fantastic. <laughs> Not happy was I. Now I have to write a program note on this, something that I don't know anything about, but that's part of what music history is. Adding to the challenge, <laughs> something that I didn't tell you, and that is that Jack was one of the very few people who was paid for many years to write programs for the Metropolitan Opera. <laughs> Great. Uh, so I, uh, there was no IMSLP in those days. There was no uh, interwebs. There was nothing anything like that. So I went to Sprague Library. I got a score. I went to the Listening Library in the old music building, which was McEcker, and they had a ton of LPs there. And uh, I pulled out, you know, the. 13 record set of, you know, <laughs> and I, the first thing is, of course, I, I just would listen to it. I just wanted to listen to it. Knew nothing about it. Of course, knew the overture as an instrumentalist. And I listened to this thing, just listening, listening to it without the score, and lots of time is going by. And I'm like, this is really long. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then I took the score out, I had it on the desk, and I opened the score, and I found, you know, it was from a certain point, like Allegro non troppo to the finale, whatever. So I find this, and it's like this much score. It's a lot of music. Now I'm listening to it and looking at it thinking, what the hell am I gonna say about this in five pages? So I listened a few times, I looked, set it aside. Came back a couple days later, listened, spent a couple hours, listened, looked, thought, read about the opera, set it aside, really stuck. So when you're stuck, don't fake it. Just you know, kind of hang back and let let it let it happen. See what happens. Now we're in week two. It's due a week from today. Same thing. Sat, looked, listened, read, and I'm like, I don't, I cannot fathom how I'm going to talk about this much stuff. Characters, music, action, leitmotifs, 
program, etc. in five pages or less. It's a fantastic amount of music. And the singers, what is this? It's opera. I have to deal with this too. Text. <laughs> I don't want to deal with this. So I, I spent a lot of time on it. Finally, I got to Sunday, the day before, and I hadn't written anything. I had been thinking a, a lot about it. And I was relying on the fact that, I'm, that I was and am a good writer. And I felt, said, well, okay, now is the time you got to say something. So I spent most of Sunday writing. I put this thing together the best I could, at least I thought the best I could. And uh, turned it in. It, it met all the specs. It, you know, all the citations were fine. It was the proper length. Everything was formatted just like all the other papers. Everything was fine in that sense. Except that, you know, I wasn't really happy with it. The other two I knew I did well. This one I was like, I just don't know. Well, a week later, Dr. Sacker is handing back the papers. So and we, we, by the way, had class in the <coughs> recital hall, so a room like this, and he would have, he'd be down there with his listening equipment and then the stack of papers, so he'd be handing them out. So I'm sitting somewhere over here in like the second or third row, and he comes to me, ha! And I read, in red ink, very few words. I don't have that paper with me, I probably shredded it. But I remember the words. Nothing was underlined, nothing was capitalized. You've treated one of the most glorious moments in music, glibly, in a disappointing essay. <laughs> <laughs>
it doesn't matter, or any of the other technologies like recording technology or artist management. You know, it's this is a hugely or musical theater. It's a hugely competitive field. Thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of graduates every year, maybe more, hundreds of thousands of graduates every year, and how many jobs? Not many. And that's going to lead to something else that I'll talk about later. But his point was, if you're going to be competitive, you can't just rely on the fact that you can write well. You got to think well too. And it's a great, it's a great, uh, it's a great lesson to learn. And I always remember that, and I and I've applied that to my teaching. Um, well, since then, really, it's a great, great lesson. And needless to say, I never did that again. <laughs> you know. Then again, I. I didn't have any opera to write about, <laughs> which, which was sort of merciful. So, um, I also had him for, um, I was reminded, I was going through some old papers and I found some. Um, I had forgotten that I took with him a general humanities class, which is not, of course, just limited to the music department, but university-wide. And um, I found this, this paper that I apparently did. I, I sort of remember doing it. The title of the paper, now this is undergraduate, I don't know, if General Humanities is probably a one or maybe a two level course, I'm not sure. A brief discussion of the element of pessimism in representative works of Onager, Eliot, and Picasso. <laughs> well, so here's what Jack's program, uh, I got a B plus on this, and from a music history professor, a B plus is like an A triple plus, it's totally fine. <laughs> I was happy with that. Here's what he wrote, undergraduate, right? Well-focused and perceptive, you weaken your case early on by suggesting that abstraction, serialism et al. are inherently pessimistic. And there needs to be some awareness if Onager as a positivist, or at least as one who used neoclassicism, whether optimistically or pessimistically. By zapping onto a specific point of view, you ignore a larger context, and this gives a somewhat distorted picture, especially of Onager and, and Picasso, but not Eliot. <laughs> I was totally ready for graduate school. <laughs> that guy got you ready for everything. And I will tell you that in immediately after this, in Rutgers, their rigorous, I mean really rigorous music history program, I was there as a comp major, but everybody had to be, they put you in this course in Rutgers called Music History Review. It was not Music History Review. It was music history on steroids with everybody from, from you know, First, first semester master's candidates to PhDs in music history were all in the same boat. This was not a review course. This was really intense, and I was totally ready for it because I had Jack. Really great stuff. Um, I wish many of you could have known him, but I hope that gives you a little, a little, uh, a little picture of what he was. Um, as for my own story, um, I began like many of you did, I'm sure. Um, I started. I'm a product of public schools. I started playing an instrument in fifth grade, which is when it was first offered. Uh, I went to a K-6 elementary school in Bloomfield, and in fifth grade, I came home with clarinet. And uh, one year later, I destroyed that clarinet. <laughs> <laughs> Intentionally, some of you know the story. I don't really have time to tell it now. That's, that's for another time, but it was, it was, it's an entertaining story. <laughs> In sixth grade, uh, a lot of the kids who started uh, playing an instrument, playing woodwinds when, when I did, and that were in my, in, in my grade, uh, started taking woodwind lessons from a local guy in town named John Spano. And they said, no, oh, you know, I'm taking sax lessons or I'm taking flute lessons, and he offers clarinet lessons too, you should do it, that'll be really great, you know, whatever. So I did, my parents called, and he was great, and I studied with John Spano from sixth grade right up through the end of high school. And you know he helped me to, to get into regions and Allstate, and, you know region orchestra and things like this, and, and to be successful in auditioning for universities. Um, when I was between my junior and senior year in high school, I decided that, uh, or when I, when I was between my sophomore and junior year in high school, I decided I didn't want to march, I did, but I wanted to play in band. So I had done, you know, I, I marched in tenth grade. Back then, Bluefield High School was three years, 10, 11, and 12. So I marched in 10th grade, and I played in band, and I had fun. You know, I didn't mind losing my shoe in the mud. You know, it's part of marching band, it's great. And, um, but after a year, you know, the next year came around, and I said, yeah, I really, 
I really want to devote more time to practicing. I want to play in a civic band. I want to, I want to do other things. I'd rather not march if I'm not out two nights a week doing that. And the Board of Education said, well, you know, you don't, you don't have to march, but you can't play in band. It was one of those mandatory, uh, mandatory performance districts. There still are many of those in New Jersey. I don't really know why, because many districts who have volunteer marching band um, do very well. Bloomfield still is, if you want to play, if you play a band instrument and you want to play in band, you must march. In order to play, in, a, in order to take part in a curricular activity, you have to participate in an extracurricular activity. Kind of strange. So I decided that I didn't want to do that for a year. And John Spano, in September of my junior year now, I'm playing in the civic band once a week and I'm practicing, but I'm not playing every day. He said to me, why don't you start your own band? Just one day at a lesson in September. And I said, what? What do you mean start my own band? He said, well, yeah, why don't you start your own band? And he was serious. He said, you know, you're, you're interested in, clearly interested in music. You're clearly taking clarinet playing seriously. You love band music. You know a lot of band music for someone your age. You have an interest in conducting, which I did. I was studying orchestral scores. I really didn't know much about theory, but I you know, knew how things work generally. And he said, why don't you start your own band? And I was like, this man is insane. Well, I kind of blew it off. Every week from that September, every week, every week, somewhere in that hour lesson, and I had lessons on Tuesdays, somewhere in that hour lesson, he would say, so how's the band coming along? And I'm like, oh, God, this guy just will not give up. And he was very nice and very gentle about it. But he would just work it in and like, oh, it's near the end of the lesson. Maybe you forgot. So about the band. <laughs> Every week. Well, we get to May. Now, this is, you know, nine months of this. And he brings it up again. And I, and I said, all right, you know what? I gave him every reason not to start the band that you can imagine. Uh, I don't, you know, where am I going to get the music? Um, how am I going to round up enough people? Where are we going to rehearse? How are we going to pay for a rehearsal place if they want money? All this I got sick of him talking to me about it, so I said, all right, you know what, I'll call people. I'll call people this week, I'll see what happens. I'll see, if I get enough people, then I'll put together a band, and I'm sure I would not get enough people. Which is why I laid this down. I said, I'm going to do this, I'm going to put this to rest. And I made the calls, and I came back a week later, and before I got down the stairs to his basement, he kind of comes out of the city, he's like, he would stand like this, so how's the band coming along? <laughs> said, so what are you going to do now? <laughs> I'm punching you in the face. <laughs> I said, well, I guess I'm going to start a band. So, there you go. And that's how the Bloomfield Youth Band started. A couple months later, um, August 1st, 1986, we had our first rehearsal, and we're completing, we're, we're in the middle of our 27th season now, and I'm still conducting them. Uh, a lot of people think that that was my idea. I had nothing, not only did I have, no, have nothing to do with it, I resisted the idea of it entirely. <laughs> and uh, it turned out to be really, though, one of the best things that I've ever done, and very, very meaningful. Uh, those kids play for the right reasons. Um, we, we give a lot to the town, and uh, it's a lot of fun. Um, in graduate school, um, I, I should tell you something that, that Lisa knows about, some of you know about, but not many do. I would recommend this to none of you. Uh, I was a music education at Mon uh, major at Montclair for three and a half years, and I switched to composition one week before student teaching. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> Don't say, oh, Pat did it, so that, no. <laughs> Don't play the percentages. For me, it worked out. And this is going to dovetail with what I want to talk to you about today, really talk to you about. I had been, by that time, conducting the youth band for a few years and involved in conducting a lot of other things, at least for a young man, involved a lot of things. I had been writing music very seriously, had a very good portfolio, even though I wasn't a, a composition major. And I had been performing a lot. Uh, even by 
In fact, by 1990, I was, I don't know if I had switched by then, but in 1990, I had played, uh, I played at the Met in the summer for the Australian Ballet and done a lot of high level playing. It was really as much a performer and a composer as I was anything else. So I was doing all these things. And I just felt that, that as much as I love teaching, and I still love teaching it, you know, I wouldn't be here if I didn't, uh, that I could not do this right now. I just couldn't do it. I thought about it for almost a year, and it just nagged at me, nagged at me, like you can't do this right now. You have to focus all of your energy on these other things, on performing, on writing. Yes, on teaching too, on the weekends and, and when you're free, but not in a public school setting, because you really have to give everything to that. I hate the, the I mean, the, the phrase fall back on teaching should just be eliminated, at least from thinking, because you don't fall back on teaching. If you're falling back on teaching, you should not be teaching. When you're teaching anybody, especially little kids, you have to give them absolutely everything. Because you have to show them. They depend on you to show them every single thing from how to open the case without destroying the instrument, how to put it together without you know snapping some pins and keys and stuff. I mean, if you don't really want to be there, then then don't do it. And it wasn't, I wasn't ready for it yet. And I walked into Lisa's office, I'm sure she remembers this, and I walked in one day and I'd really been deal, struggling with it. And I said, can I talk to you for a minute? Yeah. And I explained to her, I said, I just can't do this. I can't do this. And she said, I, I kind of expected to be having this talk. So she knew about it, kind of. She just intuited all of this stuff, sort of before I ever communicated anything, she was great. She said, you know what? I would never let anybody else do this, but for you, I will, because I know how much other stuff you have going on. So I got my degrees, both of the master, bachelor's and master's in composition. I went uh, back to teaching in, uh, or I went to teaching in public schools, added to whatever I do in universities and composing in 1998, and I've been now 15 years in the Caldwell Public Schools teaching uh, fourth and fifth grade instrumental music, which has been more fun than I can possibly tell you. And by the way, the hardest thing that I have to do. And of everything that I do, professional writing, uh, you know, any kind of conducting, all state bands, none of that is as demanding as here's a bunch of fourth graders. <laughs> it's the first lesson, first at first week of October, and you have your recital the second week of March. Go. That is really hard. It's a lot of fun though, and I love the challenge. Uh, and when I was ready for it, I got into it. Uh, I sort of got into it in a way that I didn't want to. Um, I had been playing so much and performing so much and practicing so much, uh, uh, playing in orchestras in the city and in New Jersey. I had my own woodwind quintet. We were playing all over the, all over the state really and a lot of other chamber things, and large ensembles, small ensembles practicing three, four hours a day. Uh, I was preparing in 1993 an audition for Cincinnati Symphony. I probably would not have made it, but I would not have embarrassed myself either. It's good audition experience. I played on Broadway by then. I've done a lot of things. So I was preparing uh, uh, an audition, and I noticed that at some point in the preparation, uh, I, it was taking me a, a few minutes longer every day to warm up maybe five minutes, three or four or five minutes. So first, you know, sometimes you take the instrument out of the case and you feel really loose right away. And other times you feel like you haven't played in two weeks. You might have played an hour ago, but it just feels, it doesn't feel right. Okay, so <laughs> okay, you work through it and then I go on. And, and that went on for a, a week or so. Then the next week it would take 10 or 15 minutes to warm up. And then a couple weeks by, go by in 20 minutes, 25 minutes. And now it's getting worse. I'm able to get up to where I need to be to, to move ahead, but it was not going in the right direction. The way I explain it was, if you imagine, you're filling up the bathtub, and maybe the bathtub is three quarter full, and you let the, the water keep running into the bathtub and you pull the drain plug. The water is now, imagine, leaving the bathtub, draining slightly, very slightly faster than it's coming in. And it was like that, it was just this gradual diminishing of ability. Really, other people couldn't notice it, but if you're playing at that level, you know it. You know when you sit down and everything is right. 
absolutely right. You know when something is just not quite right. It might not be noticeable to anybody else, but you know it. And this went on for several weeks, and it was getting worse. And it got to a time, a, a point where I couldn't feel warmed up. So I was never getting up to the point where I could then advance. And it was just now slowly, now I was losing ground. So I had to pull out of that audition. I had to call contractors and say, look, I can't, I can't do this concert. You know, I've got to, you know, contract to play, you know, first clarinet for the Barbara Violin Concerto and Verdi Requiem and all these things. I called them and said, look, I've got a sub for you. And never leave anybody hanging. Don't call a contractor after you've been hired and say, I can't do it. You know, look, I'm having a physical problem. I can't do this, but I've got three people I've talked to. They can do it. It's your choice. They're all at least as good as I am. Um, and I always, by the way, got called back. Pat, how are you feeling? You want this job? Five years. Five years. I went to doctors. I went to uh, physical therapists. I tried to handle it on my own. Uh, I went to, uh, finally, a neurologist and had an electromyelogram. Have you ever had one of these? They basically send the shots down, you know, for me, the problem is it was in the fourth and fifth finger, so they send, they take measurements from your neck to your shoulder, shoulder to elbow, elbow to wrist, wrist to the end of the pinky, because this is where the problem was. They plug these values into a computer and then they shock you. They send electric currents down your, your hand, they say it won't hurt. Well, oh, this won't hurt. Yeah, it hurt. <laughs> and they said, okay, well now there's the second part of the test. Just to, you know, take off your t-shirt and lie down, lie down here and roll over on your side. I'm like, you know I'm here for my arm, right? And uh, you're supposed to laugh there. <laughs> and, uh, so then the doctor, the doctor comes over with the thing that looks like a meat thermometer hooked up to an oscilloscope and says, okay, this is going to be a little uncomfortable. <laughs> right, it, it's going to hurt like hell. Exactly. <laughs> so I'm on my side, cannot see what's going on. She takes the, the meat thermometer thing and inserts it under my shoulder blade. Yep, it gets worse. And you hear now the speaker and then starts to manipulate the meat thermometer. And I'm like, what? I'm sweating like a pig. In pain. I'm like, what are you doing? And she's like, oh, just relax, Mr. Burns. We're just trying to see if the muscle's irritated. <laughs> I'm like, you don't need a machine. It's really damn irritating. <laughs> well, the upshot of that was, that little funny and tragic story, was that there is a little delay, microseconds, right? of this somewhere in the signal between here and the finger so that for whatever reason the fourth and fifth fingers when I play clarinet they move but they don't move the way they should. I can use my hand absolutely normally. They couldn't figure out a reason why. I went to a great physical therapist at Montclair Physical Therapy. He said, you know, do exercises like this, 10 an hour, no matter where you are. So I'm out, you know, out to dinner. So how's your day? Oh, pretty good. <laughs> Do you want another drink? Absolutely. <laughs> it actually helped a little bit, and then, it, then it, it faded away. Then nobody really knew what to do, and the neurologist said, well, you know what we can do? We can, we can do a little exploratory surgery. We can cut, you don't have carpal tunnel. You don't have this or that. You know, they made sure I didn't have ALS. Oh, great, fantastic. None of that. But we can cut this open. And, uh, and see if there's anything in there that we can maybe, I'm like, you are touching no one. <laughs> if you don't know what you're fixing, you're not going in there. Because, you know, I, at that point, you might, I might not have any, any use of anything. That took, took me to 1998, and I had to just stop. I had to let it go. I'm condensing the story a lot of time. At that point, I was, I was so miserable, dejected, absolutely at a loss for five years that I had struggled against this, some, to try to keep something that I love so much. You can imagine it. Worked so hard to attain such a high level and loved it, loved it. And now it's gone. I couldn't keep it close to me anymore. I had to either let it go or let it keep beating me up. As soon as I let it go, here's the job offer in Caldwell, 
I started really writing band music seriously. I had only been writing chamber music up to that point, even though I know band music better than anything else. I'd only been writing chamber and chamber orchestra things. And uh, I wrote, uh, I started writing band music, and that led to everything else in composition, with, uh, with not only writing band music, but conducting brass bands, orchestras. Um, and it leads to this, really, the conclusion is, and you could not have convinced me of this otherwise, but if I hadn't lost the playing ability, and no one would choose to, but if I hadn't lost the playing ability, I would not have the unbelievable career that I have now. What kind of career would I have had? Well, there's no way to know. I mean, you, you, can't, you can't ever prove a negative, or you, know, you can speculate what might have happened. There's no way to know, but I really, I devoted all of my energy now, I can't play. I mean, I can play, but I cannot practice. Practicing yields nothing but frustration. So what am I gonna do? Well, I'm gonna be the best writer I can be. I'm gonna mark it this way. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be the best teacher I can be. Now I was really ready to teach and uh, to conduct. And that, all of that took, took, uh, took me forward. And then a few years ago, I started my own publishing company, um, which is going really well. My point is this. Regardless of your discipline, composition, education, performance, therapy, technology, whatever, you must learn to be good at more than one thing in this business. If you, if you do only one, and I say only one thing, only in quotes, it takes a tremendous amount of effort to become a great player. So I don't, when I say only, I'm not diminishing the effort, and I don't mean only a composer. It takes a tremendous amount of effort to do any of these things well. But you must be good at more than one thing. Because the question is, if you're not, if, if you're not and something happens to you, what are you going to do? If I hadn't been really well versed in these other things and cultivating these other things, there's no way I'd be in front of you right now. There's no way I would have been teaching here for 20 years or have anything like the career that I have now. Because that would have been it. If I were a player and nothing else, that's it, it's over. So you, really all of you, need to think about, start thinking about it. What happens if? Now you might say, look, I'm young and healthy, nothing's gonna happen to me. So is I, so am I. But I can't play clarinet professionally. It might happen to you, and young, young has nothing to do with having a hand or shoulder problem or some other thing. The piano, same thing. It really, really matters, even if you're a vocalist. You know people, I'm sure, who have had vocal surgery and they're your age or younger. It doesn't matter if you take care, I mean, it does matter if you take care of yourself, you should, but anything can happen. Now, even if nothing happens to you, which it probably won't, statistically, most people don't have to go through this. What about the employment situation? It's not getting any better. The industry is changing like every other industry, which is fine, and we have to change with it, and that's good if you're ready to do it. But what happens if you're a performance major and you're auditioning and 300 other people are auditioning for this one seat? Or 300 other people are auditioning for this one seat in an orchestra that may fold next year? You see what I mean? It is difficult. It's tough. So if I asked you, and I'm not going to ask you, I'm asking you now rhetorically, what are you going to do after you get your bachelor's degree? Some of you are thinking graduate school. Many of you are thinking that right now. Graduate school. Okay, fine. I did that, no problem. What are you going to do after graduate school? More school. What are you gonna do after the more school? So I'm just gonna keep pushing you and say, what are you gonna do when you're not going to school anymore? What are you gonna do to get yourself in the stream of employment some way? These are questions, and I don't have answers for them because we all, you know, we're all musicians, but we all have our different uh, strengths, we all have our different in uh, interests, um, our different specialties. You gotta think about this. I mean, actively think about it. Don't misinterpret what I'm saying. Don't take away from this saying, look, it's really bad, just quit music. I'm not saying that. There is a huge demand 
for music. As big as this subject is, we have one very important thing on our side that no other profession has. And that is that every single human being on the planet, currently alive, or who has ever lived, or who ever will live, understands the language of music. Every single human being. Whether they're taught it or not, every single human being understands something about music. Because we hear it all the time. Even if you don't listen actively, we hear it passively, we hear it tangentially, we hear it all the time. So if you have a population which is 100% of the world's population that understands and gets it and is exposed to it all the time, that means that the market for it must be sufficiently large. So how are you going to market yourself and your talent and your ability? If you're thinking for any moment, well, I'm an education major, all I'm going to do is graduate from here, and I'm going to get a job teaching, and I'll never have to market myself, I would say abandon that thinking immediately. It may work out that way for you, but you may agree to do a, uh, a fourth and fifth instrumental job in a, in a district, and that's great, fantastic, and you get hired, and it's full time, and you go there your first day, and your principal or your supervisor says, uh, Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday, you're going to be doing fourth and fifth grade band, you're going to be doing these schools, great, and Tuesday and Friday, you're going to be doing general music, six to eight at the middle school. It's your first day of work. Teacher, uh, the kids get here tomorrow. Good luck. Here's the books. Oh, but I don't teach general music. Now you do. <laughs> <laughs> or, or you can walk away because there's about 100, people, 100, 150 other people who want your job. The, gladly take that job. The contract that you sign only holds you to the numbers because your certification, where are you music ed majors? Your certification is going to say the same thing that mine does. Teacher of music, K-12. Regardless of what they tell you in the interview, they can put you anywhere they want to. <laughs> you were hired to be a high school band director. Great, four of the five days you're doing that. And the other day, you're doing K-2 general. Surprise. I don't need to do well in theory. Oh, I just got by in theory. I got by the C's. I passed. Everything was fine. And now, oh yeah, the, so the choir director is going to be out this year um, for maternity leave, and you're going to be teaching AP theory. Here you go. Here's a text of this person. <laughs> happens all the time. Oh, but I, I don't need. I don't really need to learn. I don't really need to learn about the augmented six chord. We just kind of <laughs> have to do it. <laughs> really, just to, really don't really need to. And then. You'll see. <laughs> now, maybe it won't happen that way, but my point is more and more these things are consolidated and it may happen to you. So what will you do? How many of you have thought about these things, honestly, really, or think about them? Yeah, this doesn't count. This is like, um, this is like, yes. I see a few people are like, yeah, I'm thinking about it. Dr. Kumpel, right? <laughs> I'm feeling their boss, okay? Stay on topic. Think about it every day. Right, that's exactly. Well, you see, Dr. Kumpel is a, an aspiring uh, restaurateur, too, right? Someday? Someday. Kumpel. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely want stock in that company. So, you know, you need to be you need to be thinking about what's going to happen in the future. You can't predict it, no one can, but if you have some kind of plan B, some kind of plan C, at least even if it doesn't work out, you'll have given it the best try that you can. But I'll tell you, you're in competition, especially in this area of the country, with some of the best musicians on the planet. You gotta try to be one of them. What's good enough here, and I would say the same thing if I were saying this in Juilliard, What's good enough here, what's good enough in any one institution is not good enough because the world is a lot bigger than what you see here. And then you have to think about how you're going to market yourself. Now, you live at a time, we all do, where that's really easy to do. You don't need to spend any money on it either. YouTube, you know, if you're doing great recordings, you, know, you, you play this really well at this performance or you know, you're in your home studio and you can play this and you have somebody play it. Come. Put the stuff up on YouTube, get a YouTube channel and start getting the stuff out there. You don't know who's going to hear it. I mean, make sure it's good. 
<laughs> Don't put up stuff like this. <laughs> you know, this is just a little gag. But I mean, really put put these things out there and keep adding to them because over time, it's like a bank account. This stuff will continually and continually and continually um, yield results that you may not that that you may not even expect. I mean, between my websites that I pay for, Bandworks Publications. Dot com, PatrickTimmonsMusic.com. I mean, the, those all cost quite a bit of money to maintain. I get m I get much more traffic and work from YouTube, putting up YouTube videos because that's what everybody uses. Now that's the easiest thing in the world to do, and it's precisely free. How am I doing on time? We're close. Zero minutes. Cut. Okay. I can answer like one or two questions if you have. Does anybody have like a question? Because I could just keep going and, you know, we don't want to do that. Nobody has any questions about anything, like even the T-bone? That's it? Say goodbye? No. I have 10 minutes? I thought this went to 55. Okay, I got five more minutes, so that means you have to ask a question. <laughs> Somebody must have a question. Yes, sir. Uh, you have a really good sense of humor and uh, drink moderately. <laughs> <laughs> You're never at work, but. <laughs> yeah, seriously though, yeah, you have to have a good sense of humor and you must be genuine. Do not try to be someone else when you're teaching little kids. Be yourself. Bring your sense of humor, bring your, your, you know, your ability, and you know, keep them in line, but absolutely be yourself, because they, they respect that. You will be able to teach kids anything if they know that you're genuine, and they know that you're yourself, they'll love it, and they'll love you, and they will learn from you and be happy to do it. If you try to put on you know, like the teacher face, and well, this, you'll hate the job, they will like tolerate you, and you won't have much fun. Be genuine, be yourself, bring that person who you are to teaching every day, and you know, you'll enjoy it and they will too. It, in other words, it's really not rocket science. Just don't think about it too much. Bring your knowledge and then take them from wherever they're at. That's the other thing. Take them from where, wherever they're at. Don't have the expectation, well, they should know how to do this. Well, they should know how to, well, maybe they should. Maybe they had a revolving door situation and a lot of teachers that really didn't do that well and they, they weren't that serious. It doesn't matter what you think they should do. This is the way these kids play now. That's the way they're coming to you. That's fine. You meet them there and then wherever that is, if it's here or here, and you bring them forward and they'll love it. If you're expecting them to be here right now and they're here and you're like, well, why can't you? They're never going to do anything. So you got to meet them where they are and then your future students will Will, will be at that higher level. But a lot of people, I think, get into the trouble by thinking what should be the case. It's what is. Yeah. They're, they're, they're people like you are. Um, some of you can get a concept immediately. Some of you, it takes a few weeks. But after a few weeks, you've got it and you've learned it and you know it'll be retained just like the person who got it immediately. Well, kids are like that too. Some flute players just pick that thing up and immediately they, they can get a sound. And others take weeks and weeks. I had one student, God bless her, in fourth grade. She started, and this girl could not make a sound for five months. Five months. Fingerings were fine. Posture. She practiced. She came to every lesson. It's not like she wasn't doing anything. She did everything that she could do. She would get so frustrated and in tears. And I'm like, just hang in there, Liz. I'm like, this kid's going to quit. Hang in there. One day she comes back after the February break. She makes a sound, a great sound, and she could get all over the instrument. And I'm like, what happened? And she's like, I don't know, but I can play now. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and now she's, she's not a music teacher, but she played all the way through, all the way through high school, and she's in college. Uh, no, she's graduated, but she played through college. She's an elementary school teacher now, and she still plays flute. So, you know, it didn't matter where she was, that she should be, where she is, she's doing what she can, and bring, bring them along, and 
you know, you, you will have a rewarding career and be fun, but demand a lot. But show them everything that you need, that they need, and, and just let them be themselves, and you be yourself. One more. Yep. Uh, you've been basically leading groups of people and worrying them into the, the, you know, these big cooperative things since you were in high school. What do you think is the most important thing to do when you're acting in that capacity and you're leading a group of people towards a cooperative goal? You have to know your stuff really well. Knowledge, absolute, absolute knowledge of what you're talking about because you can't lead someone if you can't do it yourself. You have to be able to demonstrate, you have to be able to explain, and to, and that in my capacity as a player, because I achieved at such a high level as a player, I still have that credibility as well. Okay, here's a guy who was at that level, and he can, he's asking us to do this, and he could do that when he was physically able. And also to be, uh, to be, again, to be yourself and be genuine. Don't be one way personally and then another way when you're dealing, you know. Assume that people are going to deal with you as, as rational, mature professionals until they don't, and then, then you have to say, well, come on, yeah. But just, and you have to be having fun with it. You have to be, you have to be having fun with it. If you're not having fun with it, that's another thing that's great about Jack. He had more fun doing what he did. He conducted a lot too, choirs and orchestras. You know, you, you have to have fun doing what you're doing. If that, if you can show people that you have fun doing this high level stuff, they're always attracted to to that stuff. I mean, if you're gonna if you're gonna be spending time doing anything, and music demands probably more time than almost anything else, except maybe the medical profession, um, then you have to you have to be communicating that how much you love it, what your passion for it is. I know I have to end, right? <laughs> Thank you all for coming today. I really appreciate it.